What a splendid day, said Anne, drawing a long breath. Isn't it good just to be alive on a day like this? I pity the people who aren't born yet for missing it. They may have good days, of course, but they can never have this one. And it's splendid still to have such a lovely way to go to school by, isn't it? It's a lot nicer than going round by the road that is so dusty and hot, said Diana, practically peeping into her dinner basket and mentally calculating if the three juicy, toothsome raspberry tarts reposing there were divided among ten girls how many bites each girl would have. The little girls of Avon Lee School always pooled their lunches, and to eat three raspberry tarts all alone, or even to share them only with one's best chum, would have forever and ever branded as awful mean, the girl who did it. And yet, when the tarts were divided among ten girls, you just got enough to tantalize you. The way Anne and Diana went to school was a pretty one. Anne thought those walks to and from school with Diana couldn't be improved upon even by imagination. Going around by the main road would have been so unromantic. But to go by Lover's Lane and Willowmere and Violet Vale and the birch path was romantic, if ever anything was. Lover's Lane opened out below the orchard at Green Gables and stretched far up into the woods to the end of the Cuthbert farm. It was the way by which the cows were taken to the back pasture and the wood hauled home in winter. Anne had named it Lover's Lane before she had been a month at Green Gables. Not that lovers ever really walk there, she explained to Marilla, but Diana and I are reading a perfectly magnificent book, and there's a Lover's Lane in it. So we want to have one too. And it's a very pretty name, don't you think? So romantic. We can imagine the lovers into it, you know. I like that lane because you can think out loud there without people calling you crazy. Anne, starting out alone in the morning, went down Lover's Lane as far as the brook. Here, Diana met her, and the two little girls went on up the lane under the leafy arch of maples. Maples are such sociable trees, said Anne. They're always rustling and whispering to you. Until they came to a rustic bridge. Then they left the lane and walked through Mr. Barry's back field and past Willamere. Beyond Willamere came Violet Vale, a little green dimple in the shadow of Mr. Andrew Bell's big woods. Of course there are no violets there now, Anne told Marilla. But Diana says there are millions of them in spring. Oh, Marilla, can't you just imagine you see them? It actually takes away my breath. I named it Violet Vale. Diana says she never saw the beat of me for hitting on fancy names for places. It's nice to be clever at something, isn't it? But Diana named the birch path. She wanted to, so I let her. But I'm sure I could have found something more poetical than plain birch path. Anybody can think of a name like that. But birch path is one of the prettiest places in the world, Marilla. It was. Other people besides Anne thought so when they stumbled upon it. 
It was a little narrow, twisting path, winding down over a long hill, straight through Bell's Woods, where the light came down, sifted through so many emerald screens that it was as flawless as the heart of a diamond. It was fringed in all its length with slim young birches, white-stemmed and lissom bowed, ferns and starflowers and wild lilies of the valley and scarlet tufts of pigeon berries grew thickly along it. And always there was a delightful spiciness in the air and music of birds' calls and the murmur and laugh of woodwinds in the trees overhead. Now and then you might see a rabbit skipping across the road if you were quiet, which, with Anne and Diana, happened about once in a blue moon. Down in the valley the path came out to the main road, and then it was just up the spruce hill to the school. The Avonlea School was a whitewashed building, low in the eaves and wide in the windows, furnished inside with comfortable, substantial, old-fashioned desks that opened and shut, and were carved all over their lids with the initials and hieroglyphics of three generations of school children. The schoolhouse was set back from the road, and behind it was a dusky fir wood and a brook where all the children put their bottles of milk in the morning to keep cool and sweet until dinner hour. Marilla had seen Anne start off to school on the first day of September with many secret misgivings. Anne was such an odd girl. How would she get on with the other children? And how on earth would she ever manage to hold her tongue during school hours? Things went better than Marilla feared, however. Anne came home that evening in high spirits. I think I'm going to like school here, she announced. I don't think much of the master, though. He's all the time curling his mustache and making eyes at Prissy Andrews. Prissy has grown up, you know. She's 16, and she's studying for the entrance examination into Queen's Academy at Charlottetown next year. Tilly Bolter says the master is dead gone on her. She's got a beautiful complexion and curly brown hair, and she does it up so elegantly. She sits in the long seat at the back and he sits there too most of the time. To explain her lessons, he says. But Ruby Gillis says she saw him writing something on her slate, and when Prissy read it, she blushed, as red as a beet and giggled. And Ruby Gillis says she doesn't believe it had anything to do with the lesson. Anne Shirley, don't let me hear you talking about your teacher that way again said Marilla sharply. You don't go to school to criticize the master. I guess he can teach you something, and it's your business to learn. And I want you to understand right off that you are not to come home telling tales about him. That is something I won't encourage. I hope you were a good girl. Indeed I was, said Anne comfortably. It wasn't so hard as you might imagine either. I sit with Diana. Our seat is right by the window, and we can look down at the lake of shining waters. There are a lot of nice girls in school, and we had scrumptious fun playing at dinner time, too. It's so nice to have a lot of girls to play with. But of course, I like Diana best, and always will. I adore Diana. I'm dreadfully far behind the others. They're all in the fifth book, and I'm only in the fourth. I feel that it's kind of disgrace, but there's not one of them that has such an imagination as I have, and I soon found that out. We had reading and geography 
and Canadian history and dictation today. Mr. Phillips said my spelling was disgraceful, and he held up my slate so that everybody could see it, all marked over. I felt so mortified, Marilla. He might have been politer to a stranger, I think. Ruby Gillis gave me an apple, and Sophia Sloan let me a lovely pink card with May I See You Home on it. I'm to give it back to her tomorrow. And Tilly Bolter let me wear her head ring all afternoon. Can I have some of those pearl beads off the old pincushion in the garret to make myself a ring? And oh, Marilla, Jane Andrews told me that Minnie McPherson told her that she heard Prissy Andrews tell Sarah Gillis that I had a very pretty nose. Marilla, that is the first compliment I have ever had in my life, and you can't imagine what a strange feeling it gave me. Marilla, have I really a pretty nose? I know you'll tell me the truth. Your nose is well enough, said Marilla shortly. Secretly, she thought Anne's nose was a remarkably pretty one, but she had no intention of telling her so. That was three weeks ago, and all had gone smoothly so far. And now, this crisp September morning, Anne and Diana were tripping blithely down the birch path. Two of the happiest little girls in Avonlea. She was awakened by a shock, so sudden and severe that if Dorothy had not been lying on the sofa bed, she might have been hurt. As it was, the jar made her catch her breath and wonder what had happened. And Toto put his cold little nose into her face and whined dismally. Dorothy sat up and noticed that the house was not moving, nor was it dark, for the bright sunshine came in at the window flooding the little room. She sprang from her bed and with Toto at her heels ran and opened the door. The little girl gave a cry of amazement and looked about her, her eyes growing bigger and bigger at the wonderful sights she saw. The cyclone had set the house down very gently, for a cyclone in the midst of a country of marvelous beauty. There were lovely patches of greensward all about, with stately trees bearing rich and luscious fruits. Banks of gorgeous flowers were on every hand, and birds with rare and brilliant plumage sang and fluttered in the trees and bushes. A little way off was a small brook, rushing and sparkling along between green banks and murmuring in a voice very grateful to a little girl who had lived so long on the dry gray prairies. While she stood looking eagerly at the strange and beautiful sights, she noticed coming toward her a group of the queerest people she had ever seen. They were not as big as the grown folks she had always been used to, but neither were they very small. In fact, they seem about as tall as Dorothy, who is a well-grown for her child for her age, although they were, so far as looks go, many years older. When these people drew near the house where Dorothy was standing in the doorway, they paused and whispered among themselves, as if afraid to come farther. But the little old woman walked up to Dorothy, made a low bow, and said in a sweet voice, You are most welcome, noble sorceress, to the land of the munchkins. We are so grateful to you for having killed the wicked witch of the east and for setting our people free from bondage. Dorothy listened to this speech with wonder. What could the little woman possibly mean by calling her a sorceress? and saying that she had killed the Wicked Witch of the East. Dorothy was an innocent, harmless little girl who had been carried by so cyclone 
many miles from home, and she had never killed anything in her life. But the little woman evidently expected her to answer, so Dorothy said with hesitation, You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. Your house did anyway, replied the little old woman with a laugh. And that is the same thing. See, she continued, pointing to the corner of the house. There are her two feet, still sticking out from under a block of wood. Dorothy looked and gave a little cry of fright. There indeed, just under the corner of the great beam the house rested on, two feet were sticking out, shod in silver shoes with pointed toes. Oh dear, oh dear, cried Dorothy, clasping her hands together in dismay. The house must have fallen on her. Whatever shall we do? There is nothing to be done, said the little woman calmly. But who is she? asked Dorothy. She was the wicked witch of the east, as I said, answered the little woman. She has held all the munchkins in bondage for many years, making them slave for her day and night. Now they are all set free and are grateful to you for the favor. Who are the munchkins? inquired Dorothy. They are the people who live in this land of the east, where the wicked witch ruled. Are you a munchkin? asked Dorothy. No, but I am their friend. Although I live in the land of the north, when they saw the witch of the east was dead, and the munchkins sent a swift messenger to me, and I came at once. I am the witch of the north. Oh, gracious, cried Dorothy. Are you a real witch? Yes, indeed, answered the little woman. But I am a good witch, and the people love me. I am not as powerful as the wicked witch who, who was ruled here, or I should have set the people free myself. But I thought all witches were wicked, said the girl, who was half frightened at facing a real witch. Oh no, that is a great mistake. There were only four witches in all the land of Oz, and two of them, those who live in the north and the south, are good witches. I know this is true, for I am one of them myself, and cannot be mistaken. Those who dwelt in the east and the west were, indeed, wicked witches. But now that you have killed one of them, there is but one wicked witch in all the land of Oz, the one who lives in the west. But, Dorothy said, after a moment's thought, Aunt M has told me that the witches were all dead years and years ago. Who is Aunt M? inquired the little old woman. She is my aunt who lives in Kansas, where I came from. I am anxious to get back to my aunt and uncle, for I am sure they will worry about me. Can you help me find my way? The munchkins and the witch first looked at one another, and then at Dorothy, and then shook their heads. At the east, not far from here, said one, there is a great desert, and none can live to cross it. It is the same at the south, said another, for I have been there and seen it. The south is the country of the quadlings. I am told, said the third man, that it is, is the same at the west, and that country, where the Winkies live, is ruled by the wicked witch of the west, who would make you her slave if you passed her way. The north is my home, said the old lady, and at its edge is the same great desert that surrounds this land of Oz. I'm afraid, my dear, that you will have to live with us. 
Dorothy began to sob at this, for she felt lonely among all these strange people. Her tears seemed to grieve the kind-hearted munchkins, for they immediately took out their handkerchiefs and began to weep also. As for the little old woman, she took off her cap and balanced the point on the end of her nose while she continued, one, two, three, in a solemn voice. At once the cap changed to a slate, on which was written in big white chalk marks, Let Dorothy go to the city of emeralds. The little old woman took the slate from her nose, and having read the words on it, asked, Is your name Dorothy, my dear? Yes, answered the child looking up and drying her tears. Then you must go to the City of Emeralds. Perhaps Oz will help you. Where is this city? asked Dorothy. It is exactly in the center of the country, and is ruled by Oz, the great wizard I told you of. Is he a good man? inquired the girl anxiously. He is a good wizard, whether he is a man or not, I cannot tell, for I have never seen him. How can I get there? asked Dorothy. You must walk. It is a long journey through a country that is sometimes pleasant and sometimes dark and terrible. However, I will use all the magic arts I know of to keep you from harm. Won't you go with me? pleaded the girl, who had begun to look upon the little old woman as her only friend. No, I cannot do that, she replied, but I will give you my kiss, and no one will dare injure a person who has been kissed by the Witch of the North. She came close to Dorothy and kissed her gently on the forehead. Where her lips touched the girl, they left a round, shining mark as Dorothy found out soon after. The road to the city of emeralds is paved with yellow brick, said the witch, so you cannot miss it. When you get to Oz, do not be afraid of him, but tell your story and ask him to help you. Goodbye, my dear. The three munchkins bowed low to her and wished her a pleasant journey after which they walked away through the trees. The witch gave Dorothy a friendly little nod, whirled around on her left heel three times, and straightway disappeared, much to the surprise of little Toto, who barked after her loudly enough when she had gone, because he had been afraid to even growl while she stood by. But Dorothy, knowing her to be a witch, had expected her to disappear in just that way, and was not surprised in the least. <laughs>